But if I could introduce our first speaker, who's Associate Professor Lou Irving. He's a respiratory physician at the Peter McCallum Cancer Center, the Director of Respiratory and Sleep Medicine, and Director of Clinical Training at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. In addition to his medical appointments, he holds two principal fellowships at the University of Melbourne, one in the Faculty of, Melbourne, uh, in fact, Faculty of Medicine and the other in the Department of Physiology. Associate Professor Irving has clinical teaching and research interests in lung cancer, advanced bronchoscopy and COPD, and has published over 180 scientific papers. Working at Peter Mac, Associate Professor Irving has clinical and research interests in the field of lung cancer. He also serves on a number of committees, including the uh, TSANZ Interventional Pulmonology Special Interest Group, the Lung Foundation Australia Lung Cancer Committee, the WICMIX Lung Cancer Group, and the Scientific Advisory Committee of the National Research Center for Asbestos-Related Diseases. So if you can please make welcome Associate Professor Lou Irving. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're on borrowed land and uh, pay my great respects to um, elders past and present. Um, the, the theme of my talk is that last year was a striking year for influenza and it had marked effect across many uh, aspects of our community and, and Finn will give uh, exact details about notifications about um, test positive about admissions and deaths and so on but it really highlighted the fact that seasonal influenza not pandemic influenza seasonal influenza is a whole of community effect and we need a whole of community response and so I've been asked just to sort of briefly talk about the experience at Royal Melbourne and how Royal Melbourne might use the sort of the three pillars of response, immunisation, uh, isolation and other public health uh, measures and early treatment with antivirals, how we might use those three pillars. But in fact, each of you will need to be thinking about your own experience and how you're going to use the pillars. But the real point is that so together we, we end up with a comprehensive and collaborative response that addresses the needs of the whole community. Because the community, I think, get very nervous in winter about influenza, and certainly I get phone calls from the ABC, you know, wanting to know about the killer flu, and they ring me because I'm a non-government person, and so it implies that they're sort of checking up, and I think that we need to all work together and one of our aims is to instill, engender confidence in the community so that we've got the best possible re re uh, response. So it was a pretty bad year for Royal Melbourne, like many other hospitals. We had higher than usual number of admissions and up till about September we had uh, 284 admissions. This is flu can data and we're one of the flu can hospitals. And Two-thirds of the patients um, had comorbidities and were older than 60. A third, however, were, were young and were previously well. And one of the messages from last year were that young people got very severe disease, often secondary bacterial infections. And whether that was a, f a feature of the virus or whether it was young people thinking they were bulletproof and battling on, I'm not sure. But I, I just want to illustrate that with a couple of cases. And two of them are in fact pregnant women and I won't be talking any more about pregnancy but it's a significant risk factor that, that isn't being well addressed at present. But um, th this case was a, a lady who just before she delivered her third child uh, developed a, a viral infection uh, along with the rest of her family and then shortly after delivery developed acute pleuritic chest pain and, and was found to have a secondary pneumonia. She responded well to antivirals and antibiotics and was discharged within three days, treated very well, but included a short stay in intensive care and I'm happy to say that her baby joined her uh, at Royal Melbourne. Um, th this is a, another young person but this time he'd had symptoms for a number of weeks before he presented 
and he turned out to have an empyema as a complication of a secondary bacterial pneumonia and although he survived his length of stay was 11 days and he required uh, an operation to manage the empyema. This, this third case uh, in fact wasn't last year it was a couple of years ago but it, again a pregnant woman who had a very stormy course in ICU um, with a cytokine storm fortunately survived it but the, the point of the, the story is that these CT scans that are showing grossly destroyed lung are, are taken three months later. So we, we, we think of influenza being an acute illness, we think of it causing a mortality in, in a, a small number of people, but it, it actually can have significant uh, chronic downstream consequences. It, influenza also affected our hospital in other ways. So we had an issue with, um, with uh, little out mini outbreaks in the pharmacy where a significant number of pharmacists in fact needed time off work, about half of the, uh, the clinical uh, workforce in pharmacy and a smaller number of uh, ICU staff uh, also went off work and then sporadically in other, wa uh, in other wards we, um, we had staff away. And Another way that the health uh, service was affected was that um, Melbourne Health manages several aged care facilities and again we had outbreaks in, in those. So our hospital was affected in a number of ways, not just by the number of patients but by an effect on staff and some of our long term clients. So the, um, the concept of vaccination, the first pillar, um, clearly there's a huge incentive for hospitals to vaccinate high-risk patients. And there are studies from the 1990s showing that the patients most at risk of being admitted with influenza or an influenza complication in winter have actually been inpatients in hospital uh, for some reason or other, either a cr chronic underlying condition or an operation in autumn. So there's an enormous opportunity to actually get the highest risk patients that are likely to come back into your hospital or your healthcare facility and vaccinate them in autumn. And, and I would encourage everyone to be using that bit of information. And about 20 years ago, the, uh, the state government actually provided funding to the Austin Hospital to run a service uh, that involved a nurse and a trolley and a whole lot of free vaccine and going around the wards dis um, vaccinating people prior to discharge. And it's probably routine practice in a number of hospitals now. Um, there are other opportunities and, and a more recent one is the fact that um, some pharmacies can now actually, actually provide vaccination. And <coughs> We're lucky that we've got one opposite our hospital and so I can see the opportunity of seeing patients in outpatients and then asking them to go across to the pharmacy to be vaccinated. Um, general practice, of course, you know, provides the mainstay of vaccination of patients as well. Um, the issue of health care worker <coughs> vaccination, I mean, you know, it, we need to aim for 80, uh, for 100 per cent. We're achieving, many organisations are achieving over 80 per cent. Hands up who comes from a hospital that achieves 80 per cent. And I'm going to suggest that the health department might send you a cake or flowers <laughs> or money. Um, <laughs> but so you'll be aware that it's compulsory in New South Wales, in Canada, in some states of, um, of America, you know, for staff at the sharp end of uh, healthcare to be vaccinated. And if staff opt out, they need to wear protective uh, equipment and so on. But I quite like the fact that we can achieve over 80% and, and we'll be aiming for 90%. I, I think we should use it as a point of pride you know, that, that, that we care about ourselves and our patients. Um, I think there is a challenge this year because staff will say, look, the vaccine didn't work last year. But I, 
just put a little bit of data up and it'll probably come up later on as well that in fact in the age group of our staff that the vaccine effectiveness is much better than it was uh, in older people. So it, it does work. Um, we should also point out to staff that they're at high risk of developing influenza um, yeah, because of the, the type of work they do and that any form of protection is important. Um, we also need to remind them, however, not to come to work if they've got a flu-like illness. So, um, just in passing, this was a statement from the Minister, and my understanding is that it's still a work in pro progress. So, that this is for um, workers in aged care facilities. Um, unless there's an update on that, I think it's still being discussed. Um, transmission. I'll just remind you that the, the virus is transmitted in several ways. It's, um, we, we think of it being transmitted by cough. Uh, it can, particularly if you're very close to someone. It can be transmitted as an aerosol, so nebulising ventil and uh, nebulising antibiotics, nebulising saline should only be done if you really need to do it and great care should be done uh, when, when doing this in the flu season. But probably the main way of transmitting the virus is through fomites, through particles, through coughing on your hand and then touching a door handle and letting someone else open the door for you later on and so on. And it's interesting how long the particles can actually remain viable on different surfaces. So, so the concept of cleanliness, cough hygiene, um, personal protection is critical in reducing <coughs> transmission, from, particularly from fomites. Um, isolation has got two aspects to it. Um, and it's a very powerful way of limiting the effects of influenza. There, there are measures that are taken within the facility and then there's the concept of sick people being at home and isolating them themselves from the rest of society. Um, the, there are lots of guidelines as to how to actually um, isolate um, but there isn't sort of a, an overarching single policy and the, the devil is often in the detail and in the application and in my experience we're often applying the guidelines too late but we haven't thought about it when the person first turns up to the healthcare facility. We haven't thought about it when they're transported down to radiology um, or the theatre um, and once they then get intubated and ventilated and stuff goes all over the place. And so it, it clearly needs to be a whole of organisation approach. I've, I've put these guidelines up just because the article comes with some nice diagrams of how you could cohort people in the emergency department, in, in a, an outpatient clinic, in a ward, in an operating theatre. Uh, they're just examples. Uh, it's a good article and it's, um, it's evidence-based uh, on recent guidelines. Um, we, at the time of the uh, last pandemic, we, we did a study of, um, of viral illness in a cohort of people with very severe COPD. And to our surprise, the likelihood of getting any viral infection was inversely proportional to the severity of their COPD, either by Bogue index, which is a, a global measure, or by FEV1. And it was only when we realised that the very severe patients with COPD actually automatically isolate themselves at home, tell grandchildren not to visit, etc. And it was the more mobile COPD patients who were at greater risk. And once we realised that, where we, we could explain this apparent paradox. And, and we certainly use it as a, a, um, as, a, as a way of protecting our highest risk patients. And if necessary, we send out a nurse to see them when they start their exacerbation, rather than having them come into ED, where they can be a risk to other people and other people can be a risk to them. Um, 
the use of antiviral medication, again, it's a resource that's probably been underused in the past. I think possibly because a one day reduction in symptoms was thought to be not very much. But in fact, that the response on admission rates, um, the, the, the protection against um, or the reduction in severe outcomes um, is a strong reason for using antivirals in selected people. Um, interestingly, New Zealand have had a policy of providing over-the-counter antivirals in season for 10 years. I, I wasn't able to find any outcome data apart from the fact that they haven't seen any increase in, um, in um, antiviral resistance. Um, and the other way that antivirals can be used is to prevent um, disease post-exposure. And we're certainly using that at Melbourne Health, um, particularly in our aged care facilities where um, using a combination of nurse-led testing of anyone with a, um, a flu-like illness and then um, the ability to prescribe and dispense an antiviral quickly uh, under the direction of ID um, is already in place. Um, so th these were sort of take-home messages that I wrote last year you know, after there was chaos at Royal Melbourne uh, and I was you know, particularly uh, sort of influenced by the severity of disease and the, and the, the secondary bacterial pneumonia and the fact that um, you know, God seemed to have had his wrath on Royal Melbourne but in, um, and, and the last comment about um, you know, needing better vaccines and, and children being vaccinated, I was sort of thinking of the rest of the community. Um, both of those have eventuated. But in thinking about it sort of more globally this year, um, you know, the take home message for me is that each organisation needs to come up with a, a rational plan. But it needs to be that in the context that this is a, a much bigger problem and we need to be collaborative and cooperative, um, that we need to be able to instil a feeling of confidence in our patients. And I've said nothing about communication, but clearly communication is going to be the, the key to all of this. So thank you very much.